the the big thing when we did the last interview was me thinking like I'm the least interesting person here. Uh, <laughs> so that's why I wanted to flip it. Uh, you're definitely not the least interesting by any stretch. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Practical Creative Podcast, where I talk to my guests about the how and the why of creativity. At least that's what I normally do. In this episode, though, we're doing something a little bit different, and I'm going to be on the other side of the microphone. In the last series of the podcast, I interviewed Magnus Gorenson, design director at Lego's Creative Play Lab. And after our conversation, Magnus reached out and offered to interview me in return, specifically about my performance work. One of my many roles as a creative is being a creature performer. I trained as an actor, and I specialize in bringing non-human characters to life. And one of the most well-known of these was Tinky Winky from the Teletubbies. And as you'll hear in a minute, this struck a chord with Magnus, who has a particular relationship with that character. Some of the topics we covered in this conversation include how I discovered the world of creature performance, my early training, and how it continues to influence my work today, as well as how that training overlaps with how designers work, how I use physical constraints to inform the creative process, we talk about some of the unique challenges of this line of work, and we compare notes on a few practical tips for creatives. Please enjoy this slightly different episode of The Practical Creative. <music> We could start by um, me telling you the story about why I thought Tinky Winky was so interesting. Great. Uh, I mean, in general, I like characters, but Tinky Winky has a special memory for me because um, when my son was young, he was two, three years old, uh, he kept on waking up at five. And on the Swedish television, there was this morning show, and it started at six. So every morning we were kind of waiting for the show to start, just looking at the screen, you know, like the pre-start screen. Um, and then there were uh, Teletubbies. Um, and for me, that was, I, I remember the first time I saw it, it was a strange experience because Teletubbies, for an adult, uh, it, it, it made my brain hurt. <laughs> Um, but I could see my son was just loving it. And I think that Teletubbies and maybe some other characters uh, like the Night Garden, they have that same thing. It's like it, adults cannot interpret the content, but kids love it. So there was an eye opener for me seeing the, the Teletubbies as an adult for the first time. I, I've never watched it before. So, so that's why I wanted to, or was so interested when you reached out for the very first time and said like, yeah, I played Tinky Winky. And I was like, wow, I, I really want to talk to this guy. Right. But I mean, Tinky Winky is one of your characters, right? Mm -hmm. you, you sent me a whole list of, of these uh, strange characters, the Cyberman in Doctor Who, Sack from Singillus, Cooper the Sk Sasquatch, mm -hmm. and Neil the Sloth. Mm -hmm. So that, that's quite a um, parade of very special characters. But I guess Tinky Winky is special? I think, yeah, I think he is. There, partly because there is the, he, he's influenced, or the Teletubbies have influenced so many, I, I guess even generations of children. Uh, it's been around for a long time. And the it's it sort of gotten to the point where it's, it's gotten into the culture so that even university students would go back and watch Teletubbies and they'll rem they remember it very fondly. So uh, people who grew up with it are, are, are now becoming adults with their own children and then almost bringing their own memories of what it was like when they first watched it. And now their children are, and now they're watching it with their children as, as either there are reruns of the original series or the new series that I was in. And, it, so it's been around long enough, like other bits of pop culture, like, I don't know, say Star Trek. <laughs> yeah. You can compare Teletubbies to Star Trek in, in some ways, um, that they, they do become almost memes in their own right, and they become mm. uh, constant reference points. For example, I have a, 
a Google alert set for Teletubbies so I can keep tabs of, of what's happening in terms of the, the brand and how people are talking about it. But more often than not, people are using the Teletubbies as a reference point. So um, a lot of contemporary architecture is referred to looking like the Teletubbies house, if it has any sort of dome structure, or if uh, a celebrity wears an outfit that's all one color, they'll be referred to as looking like a Teletubby. They've kind of moved beyond just being children's entertainment into something that we all have as a common reference point. And being invited to be a part of that legacy was really, really, really exciting. It, it was both exciting and quite daunting because you're, you're taking on, uh, you're, you're trying to recreate or bring life back into something that, that is so iconic that when you're asked to then portray that character again on the screen, it's quite a, it's quite a responsibility because you know that you're, you're, you're carrying the, the hopes and dreams and memories of so many people with you and you want to do justice to that. That's true. Um, how many generations of actors have ac actually played tele uh, Tinky Winky? Tinky Winky would have been, um, I think I would be number three. Okay, so not that many. No, not that many. How many years it's been going? Yeah, well, the, the first, the original cast did, uh, I, think they, I think that ran for about 10 se series, so almost 10 years of producing fresh content. And then there was a gap of uh, several years, and then, then there was a, another two years worth of production, which is one that I was working on. Um, and so you're talking about literally hundreds of episodes and those episodes have been broadcast around the world and, and not broadcast once. That, that kind of content for, for that age group, that children really enjoy repetition. So yeah. those, those episodes are repeated over and over and over and over again because children see fresh things. Well, there, there are a couple of things. Children really enjoy the, the repetition and recognizing something familiar, which adults might find a bit dull and boring. I've seen that episode of Star Trek. I, I know how it ends. I'm not interested anymore. Yeah. Uh, whereas children will watch the same episode over and over and over again, but also they'll start to see new things in it. So they, they enjoy the comfort of the familiar, but then they, as they age, they start to find new things in, in each episode that becomes entertaining that they may not have acknowledged or they might have missed when they first saw it. Yeah. Actually, I read that that's the, the like, uh, you could say the, the vision behind Sesame Street. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that's where uh, that type of thinking came from, that kids don't want a constant newness at that mm. age. They, they want some kind of familiarity, um, but then some things are new that they will see the second time and the third time and the fourth time. And, and that's why also those, um, the Sesame Street was so popular and, and successful. Mm. So I guess it's the, uh, that knowledge that has um, kept on going into Teletubbies. Absolutely. And the, the guy who originally conceived of the Teletubbies, who also conceived of Night Garden, is Andy Davenport. And he is a, uh, I believe, a developmental child psychologist. So he, uh. he understands how children's minds work and how they perceive the world and how, they're, how they are learning and what it is that catches their interest. And he folds all of that into the creation of each one of these these brands or these series and not just in terms of the conception of it the, the concept but also into the scripts of them so they're all there is a almost a scientific underpinning but definitely a psychological underpinning to to what these are so how much as an actor how much do you need to um gain knowledge regarding all these things before you start becoming the the character? That's a really good question. I think we, I don't need to have, I, yeah, I'm certainly not a, a psychologist. I don't have you that, that background, but it's helpful to understand the, why it's structured the way it is. For example, why the Teletubbies speak the way they do. It sounds like baby talk, but it's the way that children learn language is that they don't they, this is how I understand it. As children are learning language, they're trying to replicate the sounds that adults are making, but they don't do it exactly. They don't do it precisely. And they're fine tuning as they go. And that's one of the reasons why the Teletubbies have the vocabulary that they do 
is replicating how children are actually learning language and how children actually speak. Uh, as I understand, there was initially, when the Teletubbies first came out, there was a controversy over whether or not that almost um, a truncated vo form of speech was actually going to inhibit how children learned language. And, but I, as I said, Andy Davenport, who created it, had done that intentionally by, by looking at how children actually learn language and replicating it. So he was actually feeding back into the children's learning process what they're doing themselves anyway. And it, wow. doesn't, it didn't get in the way in the end. It, it very clearly became a th I, uh, understood that it, uh, it wasn't inhibiting, inhibiting children's ability to learn language. That's, that's amazing. I didn't know that. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, from an adult point of view, you, you kind of hear the repetition mm -hmm. uh, and that baby language, but um, I, I didn't know that there was uh, some proper science behind it. That's really yeah. cool here. Mm -hmm. So when you're creating, when you're working, uh, when you're working as an actor with that, you understand then that that's what this is. So that this this vocabulary that we have has is rooted in something. It's not uh, just completely made up language. There's an intention behind it, and that almost gives you a confidence as as an actor going into this. Going like this is more than just four colorful characters bobbling about on camera and having a good time. This is actually has a purpose. There's a reason for this existing in the world and, and children will get more out of this than just pure entertainment. And th I think that's what really good children's television is. Even Sesame Street, you know, they'll have uh, this episode is sponsored by the letter L or the color blue. And so there's always an educational element that's woven into, and if it's really good, it's woven into the content in such a way that it doesn't really feel didactic. It doesn't feel like we're teaching you something. We're just absorbing this knowledge in a way that's just fun and engaging. Yeah, exactly. I mean, teaching is, or, or learning new things as a child, it, it is so much fun. But mm. uh, there is a fine line between that and like you, you feel, feel forced and you feel it's just fun. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's part of the enduring charm of the Teletubbies is there was uh, something quite surreal for the parents to look at, but there was something very, very engaging and, and informative or educational for the children, but they didn't feel like that was happening, that they were just enjoying the experience. I yeah. can say that's the best way to learn anything is if we can enjoy the process of learning, it almost yeah. happens subconsciously or unconsciously we're not aware of it but we are taking in that information and uh it, then it becomes joyful i think yes i mean that's very related to a lot of the the thinking that we have at, at lego as well um, it's about making learning fun mm, absolutely but um I, I had a question about um so you said that tinky wink was special from that angle that and there there was something more to it there was a purpose was there any other character um, from the ones that I mentioned before or any other characters that you played that had the same kind of feeling of purpose? Uh, yes, absolutely. Because a lot, of the, well, a lot of the characters that I have done have been on children's television and so much of children's television needs to have a, well, it doesn't need to have, but is generally geared towards, particularly if it's from a public service broadcaster like the BBC, they're looking for it to have a dual purpose, to be educational and entertaining. So Teletubbies definitely ticks that box. And the you mentioned earlier on Zach from Zingzilla's. Yeah. So that was a another BBC production. And uh, so Zach is a young gorilla, and he's in a band yeah. uh, with with three other primates. So there's a, an orangutan and a gibbon and um, a chimpanzee. So, and so we're sort of almost uh, anthropomorphized primates in a kind of a cartoony way, but they, they're in a band and every episode, uh, there are two things that happen, which I think are really fantastic in that series is the band has to deal with all of the, <laughs> the disputes that a band might have in terms of who gets the, who gets the solo, who gets to hold the limelight, who's, who comes up with a lyric and gets credit for it. All the kinds of internal tensions that a band might have or any group of children might have in playing a game. They, mm. There might be all those, those potential uh, points where they have to work on sharing and diplomacy and listening and creating space for each other. So the band had to do that, but also every episode had a guest musician. So generally it would start with, oh, we're stuck for an idea for a song, what, what should it be? 
and they might throw around a few ideas and then they'll hear something in the distance, some bit of music, and then they'll run off down to, to the beach and there would be a live, uh, you know, live being a, an actual human musician. And we had incredible musicians of, from every genre. We had uh, yodeling, we had rock music, we had um, uh, we, we had a classical orchestra with the BBC orchestra in. So each one of these groups of musicians would be, would be playing and the characters would come down, watch them play, and then be inspired by whatever that instrument was or the, the quality of the sound that they're creating. Let's see, we had uh, jazz musicians doing scat, uh, which was fantastic. So that was, what, that was a great one, was um, a, a jazz musician singing scat, and it was about not being able to come up with any lyrics. So we had this great music, but I don't, I don't have any words for it. I, I can't think of any good words. And go, well, what happens if you don't use words? And then it was Cleo Lane was the uh, jazz singer. And they go down and they hear Cleo Lane singing this song that has no real English words. They're just sounds. Mm. And they go back to the studio and they, uh, to their, their tree house where they create their songs. And then they, they develop a song where they're just using scat and just playing with the, the joy of the sounds of language. Or, or not even language. Yeah. So it had that, uh, the musical component as well. So yeah. it's all about you know, children working together, but then also folding in this other idea of there are so many different kinds of music around the world with the different kind of feelings or emotions that might be associated with them. So jazz has a different feeling from rock. Uh, and that's, it was just absolutely glorious. Mm. So, so that was more of a, <clears throat> that was also voice acting in that uh, series? No, actually, that, uh, that, that, was, uh, that was a really interesting way of working where I was the body of Zach. So I was inside the, the suit. So if you watch the, the show, you'll see me on screen. But the voice was done by a brilliant uh, voice actor by the name of Michael Ofe. And he uh. has well, one it's the lead singer of the band. So he has to have a good singing voice, which I do not. <laughs> you don't want to hear me sing. Um, and also, I, as you can hear, my accent is American, even though I live and work in the UK. Yeah. And the, the rest of the characters were British. Ah. So, so Mike is, uh, is, is from London. And he's, so he has a, you know, obviously a, a native London accent, which was perfect for that character. Uh, so it was a really interesting technical challenge as well as a performer because all of the vocal tracks were, including all the dialogue, was all recorded before we showed up on set. So they would go off into a recording studio, record all of that, and then we would have to maintain the timing and uh, of uh, everything that they said. We'd have to you know, look in the right direction. We'd have to move at the right time. We'd have to cross a space as quickly or slowly as the dialogue allowed. Uh, so it was an interesting sort of split focus as a performer. In, in the end, it worked out really, really well. And another element of that one was uh, I couldn't control the mouth either. So it's a fully animatronic face on this gorilla. Oh. Often you get to control your own mouth. But as yeah. this one worked, we, the, so all of the voice performers would be sitting in a booth just outside of the studio that we're filming in, and they would be listening to their own voice track and they would have two joysticks and, and a big screen so they could see what was happening on set. And with those joysticks, they could control the entire face, the, the mouth movements, the eye movements, how our, our muzzles moved, uh, a whole range of very nuanced movements. But they would be live puppeteering our mouths and lip syncing their, their own voices as we moved around on set. Wow, that must have been really hard to really make it work. I guess you, you, you learn by doing, but I mean, there must have been a lot of mistakes. Yeah, there, there is a, so much of this kind of work is learning by doing uh, because you never know quite what, it's hard to prepare for any one production because you don't always know what the, either the technological demands or the physical demands are going to be until you get there and you see how the suit is constructed and whether or not there's going to be an animatronic element, if that's going to be a remote control animatronic element, um, how much control you physically have over the suit itself. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the obstacles can be overcome in the rehearsal period, but usually the first few weeks you're still you're still stumbling over those and discovering new obstacles. Uh, so there, there's always new creative challenges. 
and that's one of the things that I, I really felt when we finished Teletubbies is by the time we'd finished shooting Teletubbies, we had a, a huge team of people who were absolutely experts at making the Teletubbies TV program. Mm. We, like nobody in the world could be better at doing it than we, we were at that one point in time. But then we're all going to split off and go off and start on new productions and start from scratch again on learning what it is to make this new, whatever the new show that, that people were moving on to. Mm. And there's something quite bittersweet about that, that rotation that you go through as an actor. Yeah, I guess there's uh, the positive about finding something new and fresh, but the, the sadness of leaving something that's a well-oiled mechanism. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But then also it's that I, I do enjoy the challenge of getting a new, new production up and off the ground because that's when you do have all sorts of exciting uh, new questions and new challenges to overcome. Yeah, I think that comes a little bit with the, the creative personality that mm -hmm. um, there is a beauty in, in having that things rolling and, and you know what you're doing, but there is also a point where you feel like I, I know what I'm doing. I'm repeating mm -hmm. myself. Um, and that's when it's time to, to move on. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I had some questions about your um, background because I, I, I read up that you were studying mime and physical theater. Mm -hmm. That's a very specific uh, type of school, I guess. <laughs> Harry? <laughs> yep, yep. Tell me about that. Okay, so I... Uh, I, I've, I went to a physical theater school in Paris run by a man by the name of Jacques Lecoq, who um, is quite famous within the, the, the history of European physical theater. He and Marcel Marceau w were contemporaries, and they were both very interested in Marcel Marceau being the great uh, French mime. And they were both very interested in the, the history of European theater forms and they kind of went in different directions. Marcel went into this, into the mime and being just the pure performance with absolutely nothing, no, uh, no set, no props, purely the body and using that as the complete tool for expressing a whole wide, well, everything, the body can express everything. And Jacques Lecoq went down a slightly different direction. He studied uh, gymnastics. He studied Comédie dell'arte. And he also studied mime as well. So he brought all of these different approaches to a theatrical performance and pulled them together and then created a school, which it's, uh, it's quite an international school, hence me being there. But it's taught all in French, uh, oh. <laughs> which was a, a great challenge. So I've, I, learned, I learned my French very quickly and I have very, uh, a very dirty French. Not dirty as in... Um, offensive, but it's, it, my grammar is very poor because I just learned it all by ear. But yeah. it was um, a fantastic, that, that school was the foundation for everything pretty much that I do as a performer, or even beyond being my performance work moving forward. Hmm. Because the structure of the school was that you had to make a fresh performance every week. You'd be given a, a theme or a challenge or a general concept that you had to create a performance around. And you'd be told how many people had to be in it. And it could be two people. It could be 12 people from your class. And after, after school, you just had to use your time to, to create something fresh every week. And we did that across the entire year. So, and that, so every Friday, you'd have to show your work. And you'd get up and you'd show your, <laughs> this piece of work that you tried to create, bearing in mind that you're working with anywhere from, from one to 11 other performers who all speak different languages. So we had people mm -hmm. from Australia, Japan, Korea, um, Finland. We had you know, people from all over the world with different ideas of what theater is and what mm -hmm. uh, performance should be like. They had their own different cultural references and backgrounds and languages. And we all had to come together and by the end of the week have something that we could share with the, the rest of the school. And and when you start as well, at the beginning of the year, you'd get up and uh, you'd start to show this work you, you'd, you'd really worked hard on. You'd put hours and hours into it and you'd get two minutes into it. And Jacques Lecoq would be sitting right at the front and he'd say, okay, okay, stop. Yeah. And he said, well, no, well, we're not done. He said, no, 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 that's terrible. Well, this is wrong. Why are you doing this? That shouldn't happen. 
And you, it was years before I learned the, the term for it. And they, it's called via negativa, which is just to point out all the negative things, all the bad things that you've done, but yeah. not tell you what the good things are. <laughs> so then you learn by not doing the bad things. And eventually you start to identify what are the good things, but it leaves you open to discover for yourself what mm. works. So by the end of the year, each of us who had been through that course had developed a really strong facility for making work very, very quickly, uh, making work that would be, and it's the process for making work very quickly. So making work very quickly, that was actually of a high standard. And that meant that you had to iterate so fast every day. You had to throw out ideas, throw out ideas, try ideas, and then dissect those ideas. Okay, that didn't work. Why not? Is it worth keeping? Oh, that little moment there was really good. Why is that? How can we get more of that? Okay, let's try it again. Let's try this. Oh, I have an idea. How can we make that fit with this? Is it, does it serve the core premise that we're trying to achieve? And you just end up being very, very good. And, and part of that is trying out new ideas, but always being willing to try new ideas, but also never holding on to an idea that isn't working just because mm. it's a good idea. It might yeah. be a good idea, but if it doesn't suit what we're trying to achieve, we have to throw it out it, because it's yeah. only slowing us down and being able to identify that really quickly. That's funny because a lot of the things you're saying uh, is uh, very related to how um, designers work um, mm. and also the challenges that you have with like killing your darlings. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. a great idea, but it's not for this purpose, mm -hmm. it's the wrong one for this, but it's great. Um, and this via negativa is also uh, um, very predominant in some uh, universities and, and, and some people that try to uh, adapt it. And I think it's a very interesting uh, approach to giving feedback. Um, but like you said, when you realize that's what they were doing, that's when it really started working. Mm. But before you realize that, or if nobody tells you this is a mm. way of giving feedback, then it's easy to kind of, uh, yeah, be uh, um, unmotivated or uh, even like scared um, because it's like such a harsh uh, way of doing it. Yeah, it, it was brutal, to be honest. <laughs> Absolutely brutal, particularly when you can't... Um, you, you, you can't even justify what you're doing. It's just, mm. no, nope, that doesn't work. And, and that's it. There's no, no second chance and there's no rebuttal. It's just, that's it. And it's gone. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's not my preferred way of, of learning or teaching, but I, I see the benefits of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. So, I mean, in a way, I guess that in that world, I mean, it, it's an un unknown world for me, this uh, physical acting and, and uh, mime. Uh, never been in contact with it. So this is really interesting. Uh, but in that world, there must be some heroes, kind of like the dream characters. And is it, I'm just guessing now, but is it uh, the dream character in that world would be Tinky Winky? <laughs> Um, no, well, maybe for some that that's really interesting. The, <laughs> I haven't thought about it. The thing is that, again, it goes back to how international the school is and the references that people have the, mm. that in, from every culture, people have different heroes or, or different characters mm. that they would ideally love to play. So, yeah. um, I, I remember, uh, my friend, uh, Dong Shan, who is from Korea, was telling me about a performer who, and, and this was, he had very poor French, I had very poor French. So between the two of us trying to communicate, you know, he didn't have any English, I had zero Korean. So mm. uh, tr as I understand it, he was trying to explain to me a, an actor that he revered in Korea who could stand on a stage and do virtually nothing. But just stand mm. on the stage, and as I understand it, he was just changing expression and he could move the audience to tears. And for him, that was, that was like the gold standard and that was what he was aiming for. That, that was his reference. Um, an Australian friend of mine was a huge fan of a guy by the name of Philip Jonti, who does a very visual style of theater. Uh, there might be puppets, there might be illusions, but it's in a, 
theater context, and it's very much about playing with perception in a lot of his work. So people have different ideals that they would that that they that had been formed from their culture and that they had brought with them. And mm. for me, going into this work, for me that would have been a company here in the UK called DV8, and okay. they were quite. Um, they they were a very more of a dance based company, but they were in a they were doing a lot of dance on film, and the dance often had a narrative element to it. And I thought the work that they were doing was absolutely outstanding. Uh, but the the then yeah, so I guess Tinky Winky wasn't even on my radar. It wasn't something I, I had ever considered. And my interest at the time was to go out and create original theater, to create uh, completely new work, which is what we'd been trained to do: is create original work uh, constantly and develop your own ideas on how to express or explore an idea, and mm. w- which I did for many years. I, I I ran my own theater company for several years, but when I became aware of the sort of creature performance of doing things like Tinky Winky, when I saw that world that I, I got so excited because it, it allowed me to bring the, the physical aspect of my training that, that I love. I love that physical exploration into, into more, these more imaginative worlds, into these worlds that were not reality based. Mm. Because as an actor, I, I very quickly realized that I'm not interested in, a in realistic performance uh, realistic characters i'm not i'm never going to be a great uh uh i don't know working on say a streetcar named desire or um anything by chekhov these are sort of theatrical plays that are sort of in the canon of great uh, where actors get to go and really you know show what they're capable of but they're very much about humans talking to other humans in a human setting yeah and i I don't thrive in that environment. I don't find it very stimulating imaginatively. Uh, and I, I find the level of performance, it doesn't suit me. Whereas as soon as we go into something where it, it, they, they are monkeys in a tree house and they've got a band and the only way to get out of the tree house is to go down a slide, like, whoa, that's amazing. That's for me. Or if, yeah. It's, a, yeah, or if it's a great big uh, purple creature with an antenna sticking out of his head in, in this world of giant bunny rabbits and windmills. Fantastic. That's that I, I just absolutely love. So, so there is a, a big connection with your personality and play playfulness. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's why you thrive. Cause the other ones that like the, the other types of theater that you're mentioning is usually quite serious. Yeah. And, and the thing is, I'm, I'm fine with serious. I think it's at the, at the level. I would rather be serious. Um, I'd rather be a serious alien or uh, a serious monster than being a serious human. Uh, it, it, and I think it's also about where your, how you calibrate your sense of play. For some actors, they love playing with the, the, the nuance of how a line is said and how that changes on every performance and, and the nuance of their, of the character development across the arc of a scene. Mm. Whereas for me, uh, <laughs> I'd rather work on a larger scale. I'd work, I'd rather work on a, um, on, on a fantasy sci-fi non-realistic scale. Um, and yes, I do generally gravitate towards the the playful. What, what was the first character? I mean, you entered this world through something, but I mm. guess it wasn't Tink Winky. It, it might have been <laughs> another character. Yeah, it was. How did I start? I, I it essentially what it was is I started working in Panto. I'm not sure if you know what Panto is. No, it, it's. It seems to be a, a particularly British institution, so I, it was not something I was familiar with either until I moved here. But it's a, a every Christmas there are pantomimes, and there, uh, but a pantomime in the UK, which everyone call, refers to as panto, is uh, a very distinctive form of theater, which is generally they'll take a common fairy tale, so it might be. Um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, it might be Cinderella. Uh, there's a whole, again, almost a canon of traditional pantomime stories that are told. Peter Pan is a very big one. And yeah. 
they will they're they're usually very audience uh, participatory. So they 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 the actors are always aware that the audience is there, and they will they'll often talk directly to the audience, encourage the audience to get involved. It's a very family friendly uh, form of theater. And there are stock characters in that. There's always a dame, which is usually a man dressed as a woman. Mm. There's the the principal boy, which is usually a woman dressed as a man. It, it gets very, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's a very um, yeah, fun, raucous uh, form of theater, that it, and it's just generally really fun. There's always contemporary pop songs in there, so they'll take a um, they'll generally take something that's that's in the top forty hits of the year and find some way to work that into the script. So they'll sing that. So, you know, the children know what that is. Uh, there's usually a sing along part where there's a giant uh, projection of the lyrics and they'll get the entire audience to sing along. So it's, it's a very uh, interesting and, and distinctive form of theater. But anyway, the, the point being that I auditioned for a pantomime that was happening in a, a, a theater in a new part of the country that I'd moved to. And they, really enjoyed what I was doing because I, I give a very physical, again, physical performance of my audition. For, it was for um, Peter Pan and they needed a pirate. Yeah. So I, I just devised this whole uh, story of the pirate and it was a story of how Captain Hook lost his hand and had to get a hook attached. And I sort of told it in a very physical style and mimed out the crocodile grabbing Captain Hook and Captain Hook uh, crying like a baby without his hand and and me trying to wrestle the crocodile and all sorts and then and then me making a hook out of something and the director said that's he had never seen anything quite like it he said that's great um and, and he actually asked me to put that entire audition piece that I'd created it was like two two and a half minutes worth of physical performance and it's just a really over-the-top storytelling style to actually put it into the show huh. so uh, <laughs> which was like oh okay that's quite fun but uh you also, in Panto, usually people are playing multiple characters. So I wasn't just playing this pirate. They needed someone to play the crocodile, and they need someone to play the dog. In the beginning of Peter Pan, there's Nana, the dog, who's left to look after the children when the parents go yeah. off. Uh, and there were probably a few other characters as well. So I, and this was all completely new to me, that this whole new style of theater. Um, but I just loved the the quick changes that I, I had to go from being a pirate to the dog, get into the dog suit and then you know, be the dog. And then I had to jump out, be the pirate again, jump out, get into the crocodile suit, which was amazing. Uh, Cause it was on a, a skateboard essentially. So I'd crawl out on, onto the stage and then have to crawl back out. Um, uh, and the stomach. Yeah. Lying on my stomach. Exactly. And I, I just loved the, the ability to play these really fantastically large and physically challenging characters. Uh, and some of them were non-human and, uh, and required a completely different way of moving. And, and they maybe didn't like the crocodile didn't have a vocal performance. It, it just had a musical element that almost like a, a jaws kind of duh, 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 kind of thing coming in. Um, but it was just absolutely extraordinary. And it turns out one of the actresses in that panto just mentioned that, you know, there are people who do this, like that kind of work all the time. Cause I kept saying, this is amazing. I just love this. this is, I don't want to be any of the, the main characters. I just want to be all these creatures. This is so much fun. And she just happened to mention that there, there are, there is a niche as a performer available that you know, there are people who do this for a living. And that just blew my mind. I couldn't believe that that was an option. So I just grilled her on it and found out that there's an agent who represents people specifically doing this kind of work. So I got in touch with her and she said, no, we don't need any more people like you. Um, and I said, oh, that's a shame. But I, I kept on with that agent. Every two or three months, I'd write to her again and say, look, I'm doing this now. I'm doing this. I've just got this job doing this kind of physical character or this kind of physical performance. Uh, and I did that for about a year before she said, okay, why don't you come up to London and we'll meet. And uh, we did. She took me on her books and then put me up for audition very quickly after that. And that audition was the first sort of moving out of live theater and into a, a slightly different, into moving into the sort of the more media-based stuff. And I haven't looked back since. So, so you actually didn't know about this world when you were doing your studies or even when you were actually active in the theaters. Uh, th this was such a closed world that you didn't even know about it. Well, no. And I think it's partly because when we watch, we get, we, when we watch uh a, I don't know, say, um, 
the Star Wars, you, you don't question what's happening. Certainly as a young person, you don't question what's happening inside R2-D2 or, uh, uh, say, Jabba the Hutt or any of the great iconic characters from Star Wars. You, you just kind of believe that they are part of that world. And it, well, certainly I, I never questioned what was happening. How did they do that? I never thought about that. Mm. Until I started doing something kind of similar and got, oh, oh, that, wait a minute, there, 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 there must have been someone inside Jabba the Hutt or maybe two yeah. or three people. And there must have been a team behind that. And there must have been, and, and suddenly you, you see the world differently and you start watching all the programs with creatures in them slightly differently and going, ah, oh, who is that actor? Who's that guy? Yeah. Who did that? And, and I think that that was also an eye opener for me. Uh, like when you reached out and I was like, wow, yeah, there is a person inside Tinky Winky. Mm. I never thought about that. I was because you're kind of used a little bit to the CGI. Um, so when you're actually facing uh, a, a real actor inside a suit, you, you almost like you don't think about it. Well, um, you, you also don't want to, because as soon as you start thinking about that, you're not engaged in the world anymore. You've fallen out of the, the magic of, of yeah. being with the Teletubbies or, or the magic of Star Wars. So it's only when you go, when you watch the behind the scenes footage or interviews with people, then after you've had the experience, then you can start to look at that and go, oh, and then you appreciate this additional level of the artistry that goes into making something like that. Yeah, and, and that was also one of my main questions because it must be so difficult portraying a character. And I'm taking Tinkawinky as um, the example, but you're five uh, Teletubbies, right? Uh, or four. four. Four Teletubbies. And they all have different characters, um, personalities. But you're, you're, so the, you and the other actors must kind of have some kind of idea of what the basic character um, is. But then interpret that through your movements which must be super hard not replicating what the others are doing because you must be pretty limited in your <laughs> well i think that's that's where the the scope for play comes in i have a real interest in uh creative constraints or limitations that yeah. when if you have complete open complete freedom then uh, it almost becomes harder to play because anything is is possible. But when you're given a character like Tinky Winky, you, okay, you you know that he's one of these Teletubbies. So all the Teletubbies have to have certain unifying elements so that they all look like they're all that they are all related, that they are all Teletubbies. So if Tinky Winky starts doing, I don't know, um, some sort of you know martial art movements, it's probably going to cut against that it's not in keeping with the world mm. so you you under you you look at the constraints of the world what's part of the world and also what are the constraints of the suit because the the physical costumes often dictate to a degree how much movement you have or your range of movement yeah uh, and so for, for example the teletubbies we each one of those suits has we call it a saddle but it, it's literally a wedge of foam that kind of it goes from from your bum at the back through your legs and comes up in, in you know, between your legs. So you can never close your legs fully, which means that you end up with a bit of a waddle. And, and that's that's all there to help keep the costume looking very full, so that they have that that very rounded shape. But yeah. it actually informs how you work, how you walk as an actor. You you can't just walk normally. You end up having to do the, a bit of a waddle. Yeah. And then with Tinky Winky in particular, he has a very, he's the largest of the Teletubbies. And yeah. he has a massive, massive bum. His back end is just huge. So I found that actually if I walk and accentuate just a little bit, what I'm doing with my hips, his whole back end will shift quite a lot. And it, it actually becomes quite, then you have to look at this on camera and say, okay, how does that work? Does it look a bit too, mm. uh, too sexy? For a Teletubby, because Teletubbies aren't sexy. So, okay, it's like, or, or does it look like, uh, is it just a cute, like a child in diapers walking? And it's like, oh, actually, no, it, it reads as cute and quite sweet. And it's slightly different from how the others walk. Okay, so that's another element of the character that I'm going to I'm gonna work on maintaining and accentuating. There, so there are times when he just walks normally, and there are times where he might walk slowly and really twist his hips and let the bum shift back and forth. So you're, you're working 
both within the world and then with the constraints of what the, the costume gives you. And, th- and that, can inf- that can help to inform the character. Yeah, so you're using the, the constraints that you have to, uh, uh, in a creative way to create mm-hmm. emphasis on, on the character's uh, personality. Absolutely. And, and sometimes, for example, with the, uh, like the, you might have limited movement with the head. So you, you may not be able to tilt the head from one side to the other. So you have to find a different way to do it. So if I want a full range of expression for this character, but I can't tilt my head from side to side, how do I make it look like they're listening? Because mm-hmm. often when we listen, we turn our head so that one ear is a little bit closer. It's a way of indicating like, oh, I'm, I'm paying attention. Um, so you have to then find what would this costume allow that would read to the audience as being this is a, a, a position of attentiveness or a position of, of close, careful listening. So you're, yeah, yeah it, it's working within, within the constraints that the suit gives you, but you're trying to get as much out of that as you possibly can to, give, to make as real and as full a character as possible. So, so before, like the first time you were in Tinky Winky suit, uh, did you then have uh, a camera kind of filming you on and trying out different poses and then kind of anali- uh, doing an analysis of what happened when I was doing those things? Or mm. was that just something that rolled through the season and you kind of looked at it as you went? No, that, that's part of the, uh, the pre-production process is we, we get to rehearse with the, the suits. And, it, yeah, and some productions, you have more time and you have more support in doing that. And some productions that you, it's just, you've got a couple of days and you've got to figure it out and off you go. So it can be as simple as just having a mirror mm. and trying to see as, and, and that's really limited as well, depending on how much vision you have in your suit and, and where you can see. Cause sometimes yeah. you can't see directly ahead of you. Um, can you see out through the mouth of, of the, the Tinky Winky's mouth? Can you see out? Yes, out of Tinky Winky, I can see out of his mouth, which, which is fantastic. And I, that's actually one of the easiest ones to look out of because I can open his mouth and look straight ahead. So I can see what Tinky Winky looks like when he's looking straight ahead. Some characters, for, exact, for example, Zach from Zingzilla's, I could see out of his mouth. But if I tilted, I, the only way I could look out of his mouth and see Zach in a mirror is I'd have to tilt my head up uh, and to look straight forward, which meant that his eyes were looking at the ceiling. Yeah. So my perception of Zach was always, if I looked in the mirror, it was Zach's always looking at the ceiling. So the only way to get a sense of what he would look like from the camera's point of view would have it filmed. So you can yeah. have someone with a, a phone. Um, sometimes if you're trying something new and you don't have time to, to have someone film it, you can ask uh, one of the other performers, or sometimes we might have a movement director, and you can ask them, to, okay, this is what I'm going for. How does this look? And they'll all say, oh, no, <laughs> no, definitely not that. It's, okay, it's too much this. And you go, oh, okay, what if I change my, if I woke with my toes pointing outwards, what would that do? It's like, oh, that's, that's more interesting, but that actually looks like you're angry. And you go, oh, mm-hmm. okay, I didn't, that's interesting. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll try to accentuate that and you, pull that into my vocabulary for, oh, when the character's angry, I can walk with my toes out and that actually gives them a different stance. That wasn't what I was going for. So I'm still going for this, I don't know, shy feeling or, or scared. So what happens if I try this? And you, you end up just trying lots of different things until the suit reads with the emotion that you're trying to convey. And that's mm-hmm. one of the, the big challenges is you can have yeah. all sorts of ideas in your head. And because as humans, we know what we have a sense of how our our bodies move and how people would react to different facial expressions. But when yeah. you have this, you, you can have you know, literally two extra feet of foam and fake fur on top of all of that. You then have to interpret everything. Everything is interpreted by the suit. So whatever your intention is, it may not come out the same. May, people may not read it as the same when they see it from the other side of, from the outside of all of that costume. So then you really have to work on developing a vocabulary and being able to hold on to that vocabulary and performance to go, okay, this, the, I am puppeteering essentially this suit from the inside out instead yeah. of I'm just being an actor performing on the inside of a suit. So you kind of create a library of emotional expression. Mm. Like yeah. now I need to be surprised and you know exactly how to position yourself to look surprised within the suit. Exactly. Yeah. And one of the interesting things that happens is as you start to become more 
comfortable and that becomes sort of second nature that, oh, this is the surprise position and this is the shape I make when I'm uh, nervous, that actually that can start to feed back into you. So you, you're, you're hitting that position, but then you're starting to actually feel that emotion yourself. And it, so it might be a different position than you would choose when you were surprised or nervous, but yeah. you, you start to, to develop a, almost a feedback loop so that your performance actually starts to become more genuine because you're starting to feel what the character feels. Yeah, that, that's so interesting. I've heard a lot of actors have, I wouldn't say issues, but I mean, it can be, I guess, uh, with getting out of the character. I mean, if they're doing a, <laughs> some kind of a voice change or a specific way of talking and they need to really be in that character and they have a hard time leaving it, then that can be, of course, quite irritating for everybody else. <laughs> yeah, well, because what you're doing is you're, you're training your entire body and your voice and, and all your muscles to mm. move in a particular way and to hold uh, particular tension in a certain part or um, to express themselves in a particular way. And you're practicing that over and over and over again. It does become muscle memory, proper yeah. genuine muscle memory. And that takes some time. It does, you can't just turn it off and it's not going to be there anymore when the day that you wrap. It, it does take a bit of time for that to, to dissipate. There's a cool down period. Yeah, yeah. Though I'd be <laughs> curious to know if there are little elements of any of those characters still in me that I, that I don't recognize anymore, but that have sort of stuck around. Yeah, I guess it's a part of your, your story in a way and, and your personal development. I mean, it becomes a, a part of you. It, it, it's the same as a, as a designer. Sometimes you, you get so emotionally attached to something that you're developing that it, it becomes a part of you, even mm -hmm. though it, it it disappears after a while. The project uh, moves on or is canceled or whatever, but it, it does shape you as a creative, mm. the thing that you, um, that you do. Do you have the, the Tinky Winky suit at home? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I, wish I, could, I wish I could show up as Tinky Winky, meet you for coffee. That was a question I forgot. Um, sometimes as a designer, you end up in a situation where, I mean, people know that you're a designer because it's, it, it is something you love to do. It is part of mm -hmm. your personality. Um, and so you can end up in the situation where people kind of reach out to you and say like, oh, could you help me design a logo or could you help mm. me design this product? And you're like, yeah, sure, I can, I can help you, but it, it will cost you. Um, and uh, design is not super cheap. Um, and they will be like, what? No, 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 we don't have any money. I mean, I thought you were doing this because it's fun. And so a lot of young designers end up in the situation where they have a hard time getting paid. Mm. As people just assume like, that they're just doing it because they love it. Um, and I was wondering if you ever <laughs> were in that situation with one of your characters, because I could see you talking to people and they'll be, oh, wow, you're Tinky Winky. Oh, great. Could you come to my kid's birthday? <laughs> yeah. Well, fortunately, that doesn't happen too often. Um, I, I think also there, there's the great, you know, in that specific example, I can fall back on the fact that I don't own the brand. Mm. This is IP. That, yeah. I've, that I've helped be a part of, but it's not my IP. So the, you know, there, there's a whole massive media company that owns the Teletubbies brand now. But I think to, to the point of being a, a creative person who's being asked to do something, I know it's difficult, particularly when you're starting out, but I think yeah. it's really worth early, early in the conversation, ask about their budget. What budget do you have? Is mm -hmm. a way of opening up the conversation about where where you're thinking about money and where they're thinking about money. Yeah. It, it can be uncomfortable. So it's easy to go to delay and delay and have more yeah. conversation and have talk more about what they're looking for as a concept. And if you go too far down that road, it, you almost start to feel committed before you've had the conversation about money. Yeah. And I think it's ideal to have it the other way around if possible. Yeah. That's that definitely a great way of doing it. I think um, a lot of, young designers uh, and probably actors as well end up like doing some free work um, because they need to get reference and that's that's worth mm -hmm. a lot 
I think that they just need to remember it to tell whoever they're working for is like, I'm doing this for a reference. That doesn't mean that next time I'm going to do it for reference. So mm. next time you're going to be, have to pay me or, or we're going to have to work out a deal where I get paid if it's a success or um, any other setup. But you're right. Uh, being open and talking about budgets and, and money up front is the best way to get it out of the way. Because if you wait, then you, you kind of trap yourself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because I did a whole series on the podcast about the business of creativity. Mm. And because so many creatives are uncomfortable with money, uncomfortable with the idea of selling. But I think if you frame it as an exchange, what are we trading here? Yeah. So I, I'm trading my knowledge and experience as a designer or as, a, as an actor or performer, whatever that is. Yeah. What am I getting in return? And so you're almost encouraging every person that you interact with to be thinking about that exchange of value. Mm. And so, okay, if you're giving you some value, what value do you have to give me in return? Yeah, that's a really nice way of putting it. And it doesn't always have to be financial. Um, on my screen here, I have a picture of uh, a Tinky Winky Beast, but I can see that the, the suit is very big. Yeah. It's huge. <laughs> I mean, can you just tell me like the, the physical challenges of the suit, that, uh, how long you have to wear it and, and all those things, how heavy it is, and how it works? Um, okay, so Tinky Winky is about, I think he's nine feet tall. Once the once his aerial is in that antenna that he has, yeah. And um, as I said, the I can see out through the mouth. So the mouth is, if I'm standing up, the mouth is pretty much in line with my eyes, maybe just a little bit below. So if you imagine his nose is probably about the top of my head, everything above his nose, those eyes and the you know the, and the rest of the bulk of his head, is above my head. Yeah. Plus, you've got quite big ears on either side. So you have a lot of weight. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you're quite top-heavy you, you, because there's a lot of weight above your head and on, on to either side. So there is uh, – and this is one of the things, going back to sort of preparing for a role like this, you never quite know what the reality is going to be until you get there on set and, or, or into rehearsals and you have the suit because you – you don't know how heavy things are. You don't know where the weight's going to be based. So with Tinky Winky, it took a while to be able to look down because as soon as I looked down, he had all that weight would want to try to pull me over. Mm. I would overbalance. Yeah. A large part of it is getting your body conditioned to deal with that. So you end up having the stronger neck because you need to be able to turn that head independent of the rest of the body as much as possible. So you need to be able to shift that extra weight from you know, left and right if you turn your head to look over one shoulder or the other. And as well as being able to brace for when you do look down. The other things you can do, for example, um, instead of maybe just tilting the head straight down, he might bend his knees a little bit and then lean forward a little bit and then tilt the head. So you can create the illusion of him looking down without having to tilt the head too far forward. This goes back to sort of working within the constraints of the mm -hmm. suit. The, the, the two biggest challenges of wearing a suit like that are heat. Heat's the biggest thing because they, because there is so much foam, there's so much padding yeah. to, to fill it out, keep it looking quite large and round because it, and it needs to be stiff enough that it won't, um, it won't collapse. If you bend forward, you don't want, uh, you, if, if, when we bend forward, we end up with maybe little folds in our belly, but if that's because there's stuff inside of us. But if, if the costume was empty, it was just a shell, if you bend forward, you'd have great big creases and it, it just wouldn't look like a real, uh, it would look like a costume as opposed to a real creature. So there's quite a lot of padding inside, which means they get very warm really quickly. And obviously when you have the additional weight of not just the head, but the rest of the body, you're exerting yourself more than you would if you were, is it just walking around? You're working harder than you would if you're just walking around wearing a, a t-shirt and a pair of shorts. So you're getting hotter very quickly. And then that heat doesn't have anywhere to go because you, you, know, you may sweat, but there's nothing for it. There's no air moving in there for that to evaporate. So you, you get hot and then you get hotter and then you get hotter and then you get hotter yet. Wow. Um, <laughs> so that, Did you ever think? Uh, no, I have not. 
heat stroke is a potential risk, but uh, fortunately I've managed to avoid that. Uh, and, and that's another thing you sort of have, there's a lot of mental mind management wearing these suits, particularly when you first start and everything is new, it's uncomfortable, it's hot, it's heavy. And you're thinking, how am I going to do this for the next three months, the next six yeah. months, whatever period of time, you just think, oh, boy, this is going to be hard. Uh, some of them, like for example, the Cyberman has a mask that, uh, so you have a sort of a helmet headpiece that comes, covers your entire top of your head, back of your head, over your ears. And there's just a hole, almost like a um, balaclava for your face to stick out. And then they put the, the front of the mask on, but that front piece will literally fit right over your face. So it's, it's pressing against your nose. So there's, there's very little space in there for you to, for any sense of air or breathing. Wow. And it, it can be, well, for, for a lot of these suits, when it, uh, the Zach one as well, in Zingzilla's, uh, the front of the face is full of animatronics. So it's got lots of uh, servos, which are little motors, and yeah. all the linkages to make all the different parts of the face move. There's very little room for your actual face, for your physical face. Obviously, they, they have allowed for that, but with very small tolerances because, mm. <laughs> because they're trying to keep everything as small as possible so it doesn't look like a massive head. With you know, They're trying to make it look as uh, in keeping with the rest of the body. Yeah. So there is, there can be a degree of claustrophobia that comes in. Yeah, I bet. Particularly in the early stages, and you have to work on your, uh, on your breathing and your mindset to just relax and and also trust the people around you because every one of these suits, you can't put on by yourself. You you can put some elements on, but once it comes, to, for example, with the Teletubbies, you have these big mitts on your hands. We don't have fingers; mm. we just have a, a thumb and big mitts. Once those are on, you can't undo buttons or Velcro. You can't grab anything. You can't. So all of the pieces that w once they put your headpiece on, you can't take it off yourself. So if you were to panic uh, with claustrophobia or you start to have feel like you have heat stroke, you can't take it off yourself and grab a breath of air. You have to wait for someone to come on to set and physically take that off. So there's a sense of lack of control that you're really trusting the people around you to look after you in your best interests. Do, do you have a, like a safe word or something like that? It's like, I really need to uh, take this off now. Yeah. We, it, depending on the communication, sometimes you have, or more often than not, you have a microphone in there. Okay. Uh, that said, actually the microphone usually just goes to the sound recording booth and where the director is. So the people are actually on set with you can't necessarily hear what's it, what you're saying through the mic. Oh. Actually, sometimes we will have hand signals. Yeah. On, Zing, on Zingzilla's, we'd have to, we, one of the one was to, you'd have to sit down and uh, make like a timeout sign with your hand. And that was just, the, everyone knew like, okay, that's all stop. Everyone jump in, get the head off as soon as possible. Yeah. And, which was good, actually, because on um, sometimes, particularly on animatronic heavy suits, the servos, which are, are tiny little motors in there, will overheat. Mm. And I, I, it's, happened, it's happened to me once, uh, and it's happened to, to a colleague of mine as well. When they do, they just they don't catch fire, but they generate huge amounts of smoke. Oh wow! Uh, w when they burn out, and you're you because you're in a contained a, a tiny confined little bubble little helmet almost that smoke doesn't really have anywhere to go so it just fills up the the head oh my god really quickly you know within seconds the head will be full of this very acrid sort of uh melted plastic smoke wow so uh as soon as that happens you you'd need to get the head off but you can't do it yourself so you just you have to know that this is what's happening I know the protocol. I'm going to sit down, make the timeout, sign people. And at that point, people are probably going to see bits of wisps of smoke coming out the ears or <laughs> out of the eye holes or something. Yeah. Yeah, and they'll rush in and uh, you know, take the head off. And we also have usually big fans. They're also like, like leaf blowers. In fact, actually for the Teletubbies, they were leaf blowers, battery powered leaf blowers. Yeah. And uh, because we get hot in the suits, if we're doing particularly an energetic sequence, and there might be a dance sequence or it might be a chase, it could be any number of things. You, that's the other thing is because you're, you're working with this extra weight uh, and there's limited uh, air in the space. There is air coming in and out uh, just through the porousness of the costume, but there's not lots of fresh air that you can just grab. You, you can get out of breath really quickly. So they'll take a leaf blower. As soon as, we, as soon as they say cut, the leaf blower will come in. They'll, they'll shove it into the mouth of the character 
fire it up and blow air in. Wow. And it does two things. It helps you catch your breath faster because you're getting more oxygen yeah. flushed through the suit, but it's also blowing out the heat because there's so much, all the heat rises and is generally captured in the head. So yeah. the head gets really hot. So it, it just helps to cool you down a bit and then you're ready for another take. Wow. I, I would love to see a picture of that. Like a, <laughs> a with a leaf blower just mm. blowing into his face. Wow. That that's uh that must be such a challenge. I would love to try on a suit like this. Uh, mm. I mean, I, I've seen. Have you ever seen the um, the helmet of Dead Mouse, the DJ? Yes, yes, I have. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's doing like four hour sets, uh, and and it's super high tech inside with like screens and uh, AC. Uh, because he doesn't have the the chance to take it off, so he needs to oh. on the whole thing. No, I've never seen inside it. Wow. Okay, I would love to see that. That okay. sounds incredible. I mean, he it's fully solid on the front, so he can't see anything. So he has yeah small screens. It must be uh, in, insane. That yeah, I I definitely have had heads with fans in them to kind of circulate the air a bit, yeah. which is its own challenge. I guess wh what he's doing is live with loud music, so no one's going to hear the air conditioning in his head. No. But all of this, uh, the more technology you have in the suit, the more the, 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 the more weight you're creating for the performer, yeah. the more heat you're creating, because everything has to be run on batteries, yeah. uh, which is more weight as well. <laughs> but also, generally, there's more noise involved. Even a, a really quiet computer fan, when you've got really good mics on set, and everything goes quiet. Often you hear a little, uh, particularly because often there's a microphone in the head as well. So yeah. The microphone is anywhere near the fan. So uh, often the fans are then turned off uh, while we're shooting and then turned back on. So, uh, and then monitors. That's the other thing is not all of the characters have direct vision, meaning you can't always see out of them. So you do end up having to work with, with monitors, which be, would be little screens. Uh, puppeteers do that all the time. So puppeteers will stick a puppet up uh, so the camera can see the puppet, but you can't see the puppeteer, but they need to be able to see what the puppets looks like. So they always have a screen that they're looking at that shows what the camera can see. And then they're, they're using that as a reference so they can, they can see what the other characters are doing. They know who they're looking at when they and you know, where props are and so on. Yeah. There's so many things happening behind the, the curtains of, of, of television mm. and, and movies. That's, uh, I, uh, I think I'm going to wrap it up with a, with the last question. Um, mm. so, I mean, you've done a lot of characters, but, um, is there one character that you haven't done that would be the, like the dream for you? Probably. Yeah. It's maybe not in a character that exists, but I would, I would love to be an alien as some sort of alien creature in a sci-fi film. Like a, a proper scary alien or a... Well, it, I'd be happy with scary or you know, just any kind of alien. I, I mean, I think, I think a horror could be really fun because right? I haven't done anything... Uh, yeah, I haven't done anything scary yet. The Cybermen, depends on how scary you find Doctor Who. But uh, yeah, a horror would be absolutely fantastic. But broadly speaking, any, any alien creature would be brilliant. Cool. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to hearing from you when you get that role. Right. Okay. <laughs> Watch that. Cool, man. That, that was a, a lot of fun. Oh, great. Thank you, Jeremiah. See you soon. Hey there. Thanks for taking the time to listen to this episode of The Practical Creative. If you'd like to learn more about me or my guests, you can visit the Practical Creative website at thepracticalcreative.life. And if you're looking for something to stimulate your own creative practice, check out the Creative Challenges pages. You can also sign up to receive my challenge packs, where I've put all the challenges for my guests in seasons one, two, and three of the podcast into downloadable PDFs. Just head over to the website and check it out. Also, be sure to have a look at the resources page, where I've compiled links to all the materials and services referenced by my guests. This includes books they've written on creativity and business, online courses, Facebook groups, and much, much more. 
And finally, if you've enjoyed this episode of the Practical Creative Podcast, it would be great if you would subscribe to the show, share it with a friend, and even leave a review on iTunes. I'd also love to hear what you found to be exciting, inspiring, or even challenging about these conversations. You can find me on Instagram at Practical Creative. Until next time. Mm-hmm.